Hi viewers, this is Jay Swami, Assistant Professor of Zoology. Today we are going to discuss the appendages of the prawn. It is very very important in the competitive examination point of view and even the practicals for the BSc students. <coughs> So the body of the prawn divide into two regions. One is the cephalothorax, another one is the abdomen. The entire body of the prawn made up of 19 segments. Out of the 19 segments, cephalothorax contain 13 whereas the abdomen formed of 6 segments 13 plus 6 total 19 segments 13 segments present in the cephalothorax 6 segments present in the abdominal region cephalothorax is the structure which is formed due to the fusion of head region and the thoracic region cephalic region and the thoracic region where the head region possesses five segments and thoracic region consists of eight segments 5 plus 8 13 plus 6 totally 19 segments are there these 19 segments they are represented by 19 pairs of appendages 19 pairs of appendages if you observe the cephalothoracic region, this region up to this much, it is a large, rigid and enjoined and more or less cylindrical in shape. It is covered with a broad chitin plate which is called as the dorsal shield, otherwise the cephalothoracic shield. And here in the early embryonic development, the same cephalothorax consists of 14 segments that is 6 segments are present in the cephalic region but afterwards there are only 5 segments one segment may be get disappear <coughs> so that the cephalothorax consists of 13 segments and they are identified with the 13 pairs of appendages on either sides of the rostrum we have the notches here we have the notches they are called as the orbital notches here the abdomen it is made up of six segments it has six movable segments they are provided with the six pairs of pleopods otherwise the swimmerets so 19 segments are there in the body and these 19 segments are represented by 19 pairs of appendages. So cephalic region, 5 segments, 5 pairs of appendages. And thoracic region, 8 pairs of appendages. Abdominal region, 6 pairs of appendages. So 5 pairs, 8 pairs and the six pairs totally there are 19 pairs of appendages in the prawn here all these appendages are well suited for its habit and habitat each segment of the body bears a pair of jointed appendages each appendage exhibits some variation in structure and size which are developed from a single base plan Just now we discuss that the 19 segments they bear the 19 pairs of appendages. The appendages are built on a simple biramus plan. The base plan is the biramus plan. That is each appendage consists of a common uh, structure bearing two rami or branches. Rami are nothing but the branches except the first pair. Out of the 19 pairs, except the first pair, 
remaining 18 pairs are biramous structures biramous structure in the biramous structure they have a protopodite composed of two segments they have a protopodite made up of two segments so the first one is called as the coxa and second one is called as the basis coxa and basis these are the structures of the protopodite protopodite consists of coxa and basis coxa and the basis here the proximal structure is known as the coxa which meant for the attachment with the body and the distal structure is the basis which bears again the two branches or two rami the outer one is known as the exopodite and inner structure is known as the endopodite exopodite and the endopodite in both of them they have the uh, several segmented or uh, podomeres both of them comprised of several segments otherwise the podomeres the integument of each appendage is joined with arthroidal membrane which allows movements in between the podomeres in each segment protractor and retractor muscles are attached on inner side of the cuticle which generate the movements of the particular podomere the movements are generated by muscles and cuticle this kind of locomotion with coordination of muscles is similar to vertebrate locomotion but what is the difference is in arthropoda all these muscles are found on the inner side of the exoskeleton whereas in the case of in vertebrates the muscles are present outside the endoskeleton right and based on the structure of the uh, appendages they are again categorized into two types some of the appendages they are called as a stenopodium and some of them they are called as the philopodium stenopodium and the philopodium so it is very long and the protopodite has the exopodite and the endopodites they are pinnule like structures which have the exopodite and the endopodite philo philo means leaf like broad this is leaf like and lined with the cuticle a no rod like structure is seen and it is formed by the exo and endopodites that is no rod like structure is formed by the exopodite and the endopodite it is a leaf like structure whereas here in the stenopodium that has the exopodite and endopodite these are the two types of appendages here you can observe all the appendages at a glance cephalic appendages thoracic appendages and the abdominal appendages cephalic appendages are five pairs thoracic eight pairs abdominal six pairs if you observe the names of the appendages the five pairs of the cephalic appendages they are begin from the anterior end of the body they are known as first pair antennules second antenna third mandible fourth maxilla or first maxilla fifth maxilla these are the five pairs of appendages which are present in the cephalic region out of this five pairs the antennules and the antenna antennules and the antenna they form the pre oral cephalic appendages which are present prior to the mouth and whereas the remaining three mandibles maxillae and the maxilla they are called as the post oral cephalic appendages 
This is the oral region, that is the mouth region. So, antennules and antenna present prior to the mouth, pre-oral cephalic appendages, mandibles, first maxilla and second maxilla, they are present afterwards the mouth. So, that these are the pre-oral cephalic appendages and these are the post-oral cephalic appendages. And if you come to the thoracic region, here there are eight segments and these eight segments represented by the eight pairs of appendages. Out of these eight pairs, first three pairs are called as the maxillipedes. First three pairs are called as the maxillipedes. First maxillipede, second maxillipede and the third maxillipede. Remaining five pairs, they are called as the periopods or walking legs. Periopods or walking legs. These periopods or walking legs again subclassified into first two periopods they have a chelate like structure here you can see chelate like structure so that they are the chelate legs and remaining three pairs they do not contain any kind of chelate structure so that they are called as the non chelate legs. Out of 8 pairs of cephalic appendages, first 3 pairs are the maxillipedes. Next, 5 pairs are called as the periopods or walking legs. Out of the 5 pairs of walking legs, first to have a chelate structure so that they are called as the chelate legs. And remaining 3 pairs, they do not contain any kind of chelate structure so that they are known as the non-chelate legs. Coming to the abdominal appendages. In the abdomen, there are six segments. All the segments provided with six pairs of appendages. Out of six pairs, the first five pairs of appendages are called as the pleopods, otherwise swimmerets, which meant for the swimming. And last pair is known as the uropod. So five pairs of swimmerets are pleopods and one pair of Europod. Totally there are 6 pairs of appendages in the abdominal region. Let us see one by one. So same thing here the image. See the cephalic appendages. 5 pairs. Antennules, antenna, mandibles, first maxilla and second maxilla. Here these are the antennules, antenna, mandibles, first maxilla and second maxilla. See here, antennules, antenna, mandibles, first maxilla and the second maxilla. See these are the antennules. These antennules are attached one on either side below the bases of the eye stalks. The protopodite consists of three segments precoxa, coxa, and the basis. Precoxa, coxa, and the basis. This is the precoxa, this is the coxa, and this is the basis. The protopodite basically, all of them they have only two segments coxa and basis. In addition to these two, these antennules, first pair of appendages, they have the precoxa. It is an extra structure in the case of antennules. Proximally, the large precoxa bears a depression containing the opening of statocyst. Containing the opening of statocyst. And its dorsal side and a spiny lobe called the Stylocerite on its outer margin it is present. The coxa is very short cylindrical structure. The basis carries two long and many jointed structures which are looking like the whiff or the feeler which are probably not homologous with the exopodite and the endopodite. They are not at all homologous to the exopodite and endopodite. Here you can observe the precoxa, coxa and the basis. 
these are the whip like or feeler like structures which are not homologous to the exopodite and the endopodite of a basic protopodite the outer feeler is further divided into an inner smaller branch and the outer larger branch the antennules bear the sensory setae and are tactile in function and the statuses are meant for the equilibrium so the functions of the antennules are touch sense and the maintaining of the equilibrium these are the antennules first pair of appendages so here you can observe the two branches in the uh, outer feeler see here this is one branch and this is another branch two branches are present in the outer feeler so although these are looking like the exopodite and endopodite but they are not at all homologous to the exopodite and endopodite and coming to the second one that is the antenna second pair of appendages are called as the antenna they are lie on one on the either side just below the antennules the protopodite is greatly swollen due to the presence of the excretory organs within it which opens by a minute renal aperture on the inner margin of the coxa so here there are coxa and bases this is coxa round bulge structure and this is the basis coxa and basis so in the swollen structure you see the excretory organs otherwise antennary glands otherwise green glands due to the presence of which it will get swollen and that renal glands that open through the renal aperture on the inner margin of the uh, coxa the endopodite is represented by many jointed feeler many jointed feeler which the exopodite is in the form of a broad and leaf like plate called as squama or scale the squama bears setae along so here you can see the hair like structure setae along its inner and distal margins and serves as a balancer during swimming the antennae are meant for the sensory and excretory and also for the balance maintenance of the balancing so these are about the antenna coxa is there base is there exopodite and the endopodite and coming to the mandibles these are very strong calcified structures which lie one on the either side laterally of the mouth the entire mandible consists of the coxa which is differentiated into a proximal triangular and hollow apophysis this is the apophysis then that here the head forms two process the molar process bearing five or six dental plates and an incisor process ending in three teeth molar process and the incisor process these are the two branches the outer margin of the head carries a mandibular pulp you will clearly observe in this here this is the apophysis or coxa this is the molar process and this is the incisor process and here it is a mandibular pulp which is three segmented then the exopodites are absent in the case of mandibles and the mandibles meant for the biting and mastication mass mastication of food material here antennules for the maintenance of the balance and touch sense here balancing touch sense and the excretion due to the presence of the renal gland then this is they are working like the jaws so that they meant for the mastication of the food material and coming to the maxillula or first maxilla these are small thin and leaf like appendages like the philopodium the free borders of the coxa and bases are covered with pointed spines and project inwards 
as ja or natho bases. The endopodates form a curved process bifurcated at the apex. It forms a curved process bifurcated at the apex. The endopodate is absent. In the case of mandibles, exopodate is absent. And in the case of maxilla, maxillula, endopodate is absent. And what is the function of the maxillulae? They help in the manipulation of the foot. Manipulation of the foot. And coming to the second maxilla or maxilla, these are thin and leaf-like mouth appendages in which the small coxa is partially divided while the large bases forms a bifurcated natho base internally. Bifurcated natho base internally. The endopodite is quite small. Here you can see the small endopodite, quite small. While the exopodite forms a large expanded fan shaped scaponathite. This is a scaponathite. Scaponathite. Otherwise, it is also called as the baler. It is also called as baler. The movements of this baler that create water current passing over the gills. The whole free margin of this caponathite is with setae. Here you can observe all the hair-like structures. The maxillae help in the respiration and manipulation of the food. So the basic function of maxillula and maxilla is the manipulation of the food due to the presence of the baler, otherwise the scaponathite due to, uh, due to this movement of the, all these uh, scaponathite that sends the water inside over the gills that helps in the respiration. So these all are the five pairs of appendages of the cephalic region, antennule, antenna, mandible, maxillula and the maxilla or first maxilla and second maxilla. These are about the, see these are the antennules, antenna, mandibles. So these are the teeth like structures. And coming to the thoracic appendages, there are eight pairs of thoracic appendages, eight pairs of thoracic appendages and apart from the eight pairs, there are first three pairs are the maxillipates and remaining five pairs are the walking legs. Then out of the walking legs, first two pairs are chelate legs and next three pairs are non-chelate legs. So these three are the maxillipates. See this is the first maxillipate. It is thin and leaf-like with inner borders of coxa and bases, coxa and bases forming natho bases. The outer side of the coxa bears, the outer side of the coxa bears a bilobed respiratory structure which is called as a epipodite or primitive gill. The endopodite is smaller than the exopodite. The endopodite is smaller than the exopodite which forms a plate-like process from its base. The margins of exopodites and the endopodites are fringed with setae. So you can observe the setae. These are used for holding food, sensory and as well as the respiratory function. They hold the food due to the presence of the epipodites. They also act like the respiratory organs. Coming to the second maxillae, the coxa is small and bears an epipodite and a gill which is known as a foot gill in its outer margin. The basis has a long, slender and unjointed exopodite and the segments or podomates of the endopodite are called uh, from the base. Here, the endopodite is highly developed in the case of second maxillipate. Here, there are five segments. One, two, three, four and five. From the base, the names are like this. 
This is the Ischium, Merus, Carpus, Propodus, and the Dactylus. From the base, they are named as Ischium, Merus, Carpus, Propodus, and Dactylus. Out of this, the last two are bent backward here, Propodus and Dactylus. The last two branches are segments. They bend backward and inwards and possess cutting margins. These are also used for the sensory, for holding food and for the respiration process due to the presence of the epipodae and as well as the gill which are respiratory in function. And coming to the third maxillipede, this is similar to second maxillipede. The outer borders of uh, coxa bears an epipodite which is respiratory function while the basis supports a long slender and unsegmented exopodite covered with the setae and there are three jointed endopodite instead of five segments it is made up of only three segments see here in the second maxillipede the endopodite consists of five segments but here only three segments are present why there are three segments because here the ischium mirus both of them they fuse together to form a single segment carpus is like that only and finally the propodus ductilis they also form a single segment so instead of five there are only three segments ischium mirus form a single segment carpus form a single segment and propodus ductilis form a single segment instead of five there are only three segments so here the all these three pairs of maxillipeds they are for the feeding okay and they hold the food in a appropriate position to be masticated by the mandibles so these are the maxillipeds first maxillipede second maxillipede and the third maxillipede and coming to the walking legs are periopods there are five pairs of walking legs they lack the exopodite and endopodites and almost all resemble the maxillipedes in size a typical walking leg consists of a two jointed protopodite typical walking leg consists of two jointed protopodite that is coxa and a basis and a five jointed endopodite five jointed endopodite so this five jointed means ischium mirus carpus propodus and the ductilis each podomere is long cylindrical and as the podomeres are arranged in a linear series and are movable by the hinged joints the last podomeres has the claw like structure so this is a general uh, typical structure of a walking leg if you observe furthermore the first two walking legs the first and second pair of walking legs the propodus is prolonged beyond the articulation with the dactylus thus the two podomeres thus the two podomeres work one against the other like the blades of a pair of forceps forming a keela otherwise pincer so that due to the presence of this keela or pincer they are called as the chelate legs chelipedes or chelate legs these are useful for holding the food and also for the protection for the defense mechanism if you see furthermore the propodus of first chelate leg is long the propodus of first chelate leg is long and forms an articulation with dactylus thus an elongated structure opposite to dactylus forms a cutting player like structure and the opposite forms the claws 
the ductile is moves freely at the opposite of propodus and thus the ductile is called as the finger while the propodus is called as the palm the inner side of the cutting or chelate structure possesses many teeth and setae on the outer side this appear this appendage is to catch the food and to bring it to the mouth that is the function of the first chelate leg and the second walking leg is similar to the first but the podomeres are long and strong but the podomeres are long and strong it is the longest appendage of all the appendages the ischium has a socket at interior surface this appendage uh, is for fighting and also for protection and also for the capturing of the food this appendage is long in males when we compare to the females see this is the first chelate leg this is the second chelate leg of the female it is very short and this is the second chelate leg of the male which is the longest and largest appendage then the third fourth and fifth pair of walking legs are similar to that of the typical legs but there is a lack of the chelate structure chelate structure is absent these are used only for walking in females each of the third walking leg bears a female reproductive aperture on the inner side of the coxa while in the males on the fifth walking leg coxa it bears a male genital aperture so third walking leg that contains the the coxa of the third walking leg contains the female genital opening whereas the fifth walking leg coxa that bears the male genital opening these all are the thoracic appendages coming to the abdominal appendages there are six pairs of appendages there are six pairs of appendages and these are again biramus type the first pairs are called the first five pairs are called as the swimmerets which looks like the paddle like structures while the last pair sixth pair are called as the uropods and in the last segment we will also see the telson that looks like the tail fin here if you observe the structures the third abdominal appendage out of five the third abdominal appendage is called as the typical abdominal appendage typical typical pleopod which has a protopodite in this protopodite there is a ring like coxa and cylindrical bases are present the coxa do not contain any kind of setae while the bases possess many setae setae are absent in coxa but setae are present on the cylindrical bases the bases bears flattened leaf like uh, smaller endopodite and the larger exopodite from the inner basal margin of the endopodite arises a small rod like structure which is called as the appendix interna appendix interna with a knob like head bearing many hook like process the remaining five pairs of appendages are more or less equal to the typical appendage what is the typical appendage there is a round coxa cylindrical basis coxa do not contain any kind of setae but setae are present in the basis here there is a small endopodite large exopodite and here also we'll see the appendix interna so due to the presence of this exopodite and endopodite like the paddles they meant for the swimming so remaining all remaining all five pairs of appendages are more or less equal to the a typical appendage of the abdominal region and if you observe the first swimmerate the endopodite is greatly reduced if you observe the first abdominal appendage so here coxa basis endopodite if you observe the structure of endopodite in this and this it is greatly reduced and moreover appendix interna 
which is seen in the typical structure here it is absent appendix internal is absent in the first abdominal appendage and then the second appendage is similar to a typical one but in male there is a additional rod like structure which bears the setae which is called as the appendix musculina appendix interna is common and in the males of the second abdominal appendage we will see the appendix musculina this is the appendix musculina and if you observe the sixth pair of appendages which are called as the uropods here the uropod is large and lie on side of the telson forming a tail fin this appendage favors to take a backward spring in the water the first protopodate of uropod is small thick and only with only one podomere that is called as a sympod that is the sympod is a structure which is formed by the fusion of coxa and bases here coxa and bases are not visible but instead of these two there is a fused structure of the coxa and bases which is called as the sympod is present the sympod bears the oar shaped endopodites and the exopodites this is the endopodite and this is the exopodite which are looking like the oars and then the exopodite is bigger than the endopodite exopodite is bigger than the endopodite and incompletely divided in the middle by a transverse suture this is a transverse suture which incompletely divides the exopodite the transverse suture are lacking in the endopodite the margins of the exopodites are fringed with numerous setae here you can see the number of setae these all are the uh, abdominal appendages third abdominal appendage is the typical one so in the first abdominal appendage appendix interna is absent reduced endopodite is seen in the second abdominal appendage of the male along with the appendix interna we will also see the appendix musculina and here in the uropod instead of coxa and bases we will see a sympod and exopodite contain the sutures endopodite it is very small when compared to the endopodite so this is very useful to take a backward spring in the water while it is moving so these are the appendages cephalic appendages and thoracic appendages finally the abdominal appendages thank you thank you one and all